Welcome to the JBU Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Julie Gum, Director of University Marketing and Communications at John Brown University. I'm also an alum and a current parent, so I get to see JBU from all sides. The heart of JBU is really our people, our students, alumni, faculty, and staff. The JBU Stories Podcast is where we get to introduce you to these amazing people and hear their stories. On today's episode of the podcast, we're going to talk to alumni Lynn Christensen. When most students are starting their first job right out of school or possibly moving back home while still job hunting, Lynn did something a little bit different. She took off on a several-month trip to hike the historic El Camino, as well as study at the Labrie Institute and have some time of reflection. So we're going to talk to Lynn about what that journey taught her and what she's going to do going forward. Welcome, Lynn, to the JBU Stories podcast. Thank you, Julie. It's great to be here. Um, Why don't you start off a little bit, just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you came to be at JBU as a student. Sure. So like Julie said, my name is Lynn Christensen. Um, I'm originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I came to John Brown, gosh, I guess in 2013 and started my uh, marketing program with the College of Business. And I came to JBU. I had looked all over. I looked at a bunch of different colleges across the U.S., both um, state schools and private universities, and I was just really drawn by John Brown when I visited, just the kindness of the people here. Um, Everyone made me feel so welcome. I had a great admissions counselor who really made the process super easy for me during that really stressful time, and when I came on campus, it was like, I saw the people like hanging in hammocks and a lot of like people in shorts and chacos. And I was like, oh, these are my people. I have to come here. (laughs) So that was mostly what did it. Awesome. And then so you graduated in what would that have been with your undergrad? It was 2017. 2017. Okay. And then you chose to go on and do a graduate program at JBU. Tell us about the program you chose and why you chose that field. Sure. So with my graduate program, I chose an MBA um, in design thinking and innovation. So actually, my first year of the program, because it's a two-year program, the design thinking and innovation track was brand new. So my graduating class was actually the first class to graduate without emphasis. And I chose that field because when I was a senior studying business um, as an undergrad, I took the class strategic management and worked with a team to build a new venture business, which I'm sure many people remember the strategic management experience. Um, So we did that. And with our project, we went on to compete at um, local competitions as well as international business competitions. And through that process, the research really elevated um, for like the consumer research we had to do, the experience research, we prototyped our idea and just this whole thing. So through that process, because I was the marketer and the like fake CEO of the company, (laughs) um, all that research kind of initiative fell on me. And I later learned through my master's program that that falls, that kind of research falls under design thinking under the design research umbrella. And as stressful as strategic management was, I also loved the process and I loved the research component of it. And so that experience really took me directly into my master's, which now is taking me into my career. So that's great. Awesome. And we'll talk about that. You've just kind of got a new job lined up. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that. And we're going to circle back to it at the end too, but tell us a little bit about what you're going to be doing now. Sure. So when I was a student, John Brown was really great about encouraging um, just a lot of different internships. So throughout my academic career, both as an undergrad and grad, I had various internships. And one of them as a grad student, I interned with a company in Portland, Oregon called Digimark, and they make um, imperceptible and redundant barcodes, um, data carriers, uh, which sounds, <laughs> it has a lot of different use cases, but anyway, it's really, it's a cool company. Um, so I interned back with them last summer, and then I just got hired with them as the new product marketing and research specialist um, for the company, and we'll be doing a lot of the design research for this cool corporate company. So you graduated in May with your master's, but before you kind of set out heavy on the job hunt and all of that sort of stuff, you did something very different. And um, so tell us about like, how did the idea of taking this trip kind of first start for you? Yeah. So like you mentioned, I went on a big grand adventure this past summer. So I graduated in May 2019 with my MBA degree. 
And before I started work, I, I went on this, this uh, three and a half month adventure. So I had kind of known that within myself, I, I've wanted to go backpack Europe since I was like 12 years old. Um, but just when I got into school, I was like, oh, I could never afford it. Um, and just got way too into career stuff. I was like, no, I don't have the time for that. I need to quick get busy and get to work. Um, but as my, cause I went straight into my graduate program after my undergrad program. But, but when I was, I kind of made a deal with myself. I was like, when I graduate from, you know, with my MBA, I'm definitely going to go travel for a bit because I mean, the thought behind it was it, it had been something that I really wanted to do. And like now was the time to do it. And, uh, when I was in Portland for spring break, um, right before I graduated, my former boss at this company, Digimark, she really just was sitting with me and we were talking about my future and she just really encouraged me to go travel, which was kind of surprising because this, uh, this particular boss, her name's Amy, she's been really successful in her career and I sort of would, I kind of expected her to be like, okay, yeah. time to crack down, Next let's thing. get to yeah. work. Next thing. Like, and a lot of other people also encouraged me, no, don't go traveling, quick, get to work, you know, you've worked so hard, just get into it. But yeah, instead I, I decided to take this trip and went off on my own, which a lot of like my friends and family were like, what, you're going to go travel in Europe by yourself? Wait, no. But it was it was really good. So, so tell us, the first part of that was uh, traveling the El Camino. So tell us what that is and why you chose that as part of your trip. Sure. So the El Camino or the Camino de Santiago, it's referred both ways, is relatively unfamiliar to many Americans. But when you're in Europe, it's very common for people to know what it is. But it basically is one of Europe's oldest pilgrimage sites um, because it's it's um, believed that uh, Santiago de Compostela, where the, the pilgrim it, the pilgrimage ends is where St. James is buried. So it's this massive, beautiful, I've never seen a cathedral like it. It is seriously, it probably takes up like two city blocks or more than that. It is giant and so beautiful, but it's believed that that's where St. James is buried. So there's actually all of these various trails, so to speak, um, all throughout northern Spain and even one that goes from Portugal, you actually can go to Santiago pretty much from anywhere in Europe. And some people have done that. It's like you find people on the trail and you're like, oh, so where did you start? And they're like, Belgium. <laughs> you're like, oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, it's it's really the uh, El Camino is northern Spain, one of northern Spain's primary industries in the summertime. And it, in late in recent years, it's become a massive tourist kind of destination. But the one I chose is called the Del Norte. Um, so the northern route, and that takes about uh, five weeks to do. The whole trail is in kilometers, but in miles, it would be about 860, kil mm, yeah, 860 kilometers. Okay. And you originally, though, were set out and you were going to do a shorter portion of it. Was that because you weren't sure what you could tackle or because it's I mean, that's a physically grueling trip. How many miles did you like hike every day? Miles. Uh, so kilometers, kilometers. kilometers, sorry, kilometers would be um, on a long day between 30, 32 kilometers on a really long day. And so in miles, that would be about 20 miles okay. in a day. Um, so. I, oh, yeah. So you asked, uh, why did I choose a longer portion? Yeah. yeah so um, the the Francaise, the French way, is the most popular of the El Camino routes. And it's the one that everyone does. And they start um, just in St. Jean, Pied-de-Port, which is just in, in France over the Pyrenees. Um, but I did a lot of research on th all the different routes I wanted to do. The Norte had less people. It was closer to the coast. It's supposed to be more scenic, more beautiful. Um, it's cooler weather because the front, the French way goes through the Mazetta desert. Um, so that's why I chose that one. And I literally, <laughs> I kind of had like just like a month and a half to plan my trip. And I was taking two grad classes at the time. So it was like not a lot of time. And so my sweet, sweet grandparents, they, they knew how important this trip was to me. So they gave me the miles for this trip and they're like, all right, what, what are the dates you want it to be? And I was like, uh, whatever. So I just kind of made up the dates and it was like 14 weeks <laughs> like, gotta fill and the time I was like, gotta fill the time somehow. And obviously I didn't have a lot of money and doing the El Camino is super economical because uh, well, Spain's a really cheap country. The food is very cheap. And then as you stay, you go along and you stay each night in an albergue, which is Spanish for hostel. 
And they, there's all these different albergues that are for pilgrims only, and you have to have this little passport to prove that you're a pilgrim because they don't want tourists staying there. Um, and because it's a pilgrimage, a lot of them still stick to this um, donativo, donation mm-hmm. type of payment structure. Some don't. Some you have to pay like 10 euro, but the, the donativo ones are you, you donate what you think. But, I mean, it's like 5 euro a night. And mm-hmm. some of the hospitaleros, they, they do it out of their homes. And, like, they will cook food for you. And for everyone, every pilgrim who's staying there, they'll make, like, delicious food and one sweet sweet man we got there that day and he was like okay everyone he's checking us in he's like I'll do laundry tonight for all of you but just of the clothes that you wore today but doing laundry on the trail is like so hard yeah yeah. so you're just stinking you're horrible but like um this sweet man washed all our clothes (laughs) taking advantage of that yeah so you're on this journey and you're walking and obviously you're coming across different people from different places too but you're also probably alone a lot of the time what did you kind of spend that alone time doing because obviously there's thoughts going on in your head and and all of that sort of stuff but Yeah, yeah of course so yeah I did start out the Camino by myself which the first day was massive culture shock because I had gone from Ireland where everyone speaks English which was a great and then I landed in um, France and no one in France would speak to me in English and I I did take French but it was like I suddenly forgot it all so it was very hard to navigate and then I didn't know how to use public transportation really so I ended up like walking from France to Spain which was like just a few miles it wasn't that bad Um, but then these sweet people, they kind of adopted me into their Camino group the first week and they were like Camino pros. This was their third Camino that they were doing. Um, like three of them had like found each other on their first Camino and had done the whole thing. It was so sweet because I was sitting there waiting to get into my albergue and get my pilgrim passport. And I was kind of like a bucket of stress. And these people, they look at me and one of them, this British lady, Cheryl, she looks at her friend, Angie, who's from, um, New Zealand and is like, Hey, Angie, can we adopt Lynn into (laughs) our group? I actually think she said, can we keep her? (laughs) And so, so the first week and kind of along the way you, I, I started walking with this group of stranger people that I had met who had adopted me. Um, and then after the first week we all kind of split up and then you find other people along your way, walked with this German lady. She didn't speak very much English. Um, but yeah, you do spend some of your time walking by yourself that even if you're with people, you spend a lot of time walking by yourself. You know, you'll see pictures of the Camino with people in front of you and people behind you and kind of this staggered group of, of Mm -hmm. walking. And so it's both, you have time to, um, commune with the people you're walking with, with strangers. And that's, that's honestly, I didn't really meet that many people who were doing this trail for like a pilgrimage reason. A lot of them, every single person I met was in some type of season of transition, quit their job, mm, marriage yeah. or whatever. Um, but a lot of people, even like retired people do it because they love the friendships that you meet and the community mm, that you yeah. have is a real reason for doing it. But when I was walking alone, I mean, there was just, a, there was, of course, with anyone, any season of transition, I had just finished grad school. The My last year of grad school was, was pretty hard from, like, a mental health standpoint for me. So just kind of had a lot of, like, time to, like, think and reflect and be with myself. Um, but also I think it, you know, it's really good to have that time away. But it's kind of weird. It's like you swap your full-time job of 8 to 5, typing emails, doing doing real life stuff. And then you go walking and you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm walking for 8 hours. I'm walking 10 hours. I'm walking a full work day for 20 miles a day. It's like, oh, my full-time job is now walking. walking. <laughs> and I'm just thinking to myself. So yeah. you have to be careful because too much time alone in your head is, is not good either. So I, I joked. I was like, you know eventually it kind of can become like there are vultures in your head and that's your own voice. So you kind of have to shut that down. Sometimes it's mm-hmm. good to think, mm-hmm. but sometimes you have to shut it down. So I actually listened to audiobooks some, okay. yeah. and that really helped a lot. I listened to the Alice network on the trail. I don't know if you've read it, but uh-uh. Uh-uh. Oh, it's so good. So I actually wrote a lot. Um, so in every country I went to, I journaled quite a bit and it's so fun cause I'm, I'm actually hoping to write a book from my travels. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, um, I got pretty good at typing while I walked. So I would journal on my phone and so I'd do some I of that. I probably would have twisted an ankle or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Um, so then, so you had set out to do this, this big full five weeks, but then you kind of had some physical difficulties that came along and you ended up, um, um, stopping early. Talk about that. What happened? How that affected you? Having to quit early? No, you know, not quit, but stop early. Sure. Yeah. So what's great about the Camino is a lot of people do it for different stretches at a time, and and it's really rare in life that someone has five weeks off that they can go 
literally hike through northern Spain. So a lot of people do sections. I had wanted to do the whole thing, and I had budgeted that time in my trip for it. Um, but in all my research of the different trails, I mean, I'll be honest. When people were writing about the northern way, they were like, oh, well, it's by the coast. It's coastal. There's definitely a lot more hills. But I was like, oh, like California hills, the right. nice grassy rolling hills. LOL. They're mountains. <laughs> I get there and I'm like, these are mountains. And I'm an active person. <laughs> Went to Colorado a lot. These were legit mountains. And what's hilarious to me is this, like, Spanish did not believe in switchbacks. Like, why go back and forth if you can go straight up this mountain? <laughs> and when you're walking on the Camino, you have your whole backpack full of right. stuff you that you live out of your backpack. It's like for your five home weeks. is on. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. so funny because I called my backpack turtle because I was like, <laughs> turtle is my home it's my shell on my back and it's going with me all the places so the inclines were really steep especially the first the first week um on the on the Camino in the northern route that I was doing you walk through four Spanish provinces states basically and the first one is called Basque country and it actually starts in in France and goes through Spain but um, it is like like a baby Switzerland or like Austria and that's the first week so yeah I had done some training and I had been working out a lot last yeah, year. Like, yeah. was in pretty good shape. And, um, yeah, it was killer. My first day was probably the hardest physical day of the Camino. Like, up and down, up and down, up and down. Cross a ferry, cross this thing, up and down, up and down. For, like, I don't know. I think we probably walked, like, 25 miles that day. It was the first day. It was mm-hmm. so hard. So, not only do you go straight up, but then as straight up as you go, you also go straight down because all the towns are settled in the valleys. Right. So, you you hike through these these peaks and stuff, but you go to the towns in the valleys is, is how the trail goes. So, just the combination of going up was cardiovascularly hard on my body, but going down that constant... Mm-hmm. jutting motion of your knees was was what was hard on me so I actually injured my knee the first week of the Camino which we had done about 100 miles that week or more um, and I kept walking on it for two weeks and just I, th- I kind of expected that the inclines and stuff would level out at some point right yeah. and just no it was just a constant up and down like you know, those heart rate signs. So, um, yeah, I actually, I did decide to quit. I had walked about 27 days. So that was almost like, that was like 400 miles. So I've got like two weeks left of the Camino, but, um, I decided to quit because my last day I was walking and I was in so much excruciating, agonizing pain. And I had been in that for a few days, but just could hardly put in more than like 12 miles. And I was walking up a hill and I was by myself in this pretty remote part of Spain and my, my knee gave out on me and I fe- mm. fell over <laughs> oh, <laughs> like no. me. and I was listening to this book and I was like, all right, I just have to stop because what, are, what am I going to do? Keep push forward and get to Santiago, but then I've got permanent damage for the rest mm, of my life. Yeah. But it was a hard decision, A, because I had wanted to, but B, because I had been logging my travel, like my journal time on Instagram and right. doing fun videos and updates. So people were pretty invested in my trip and to quit felt like cheating and you feel like such a quitter or just like a weenie. You're like, yeah. I can't believe I have to quit and I have to tell all these people I'm quitting. Um, but I mean, obviously everyone was understanding ultimately like I had to do what was good for me and uh I ended up using that extra time I did go to Santiago because this this Italian lady she was so sweet she told me in Italian but I understood what she meant she said you have to you have to feel your dream you have to see it and Mm. taste it or whatever so I I did go to Santiago I took a bus and I I walked in and it wasn't as triumphant as some of those other people who had gotten there and they were like oh my gosh I made it to Santiago yeah but I saw the cathedral and I made this deal like I'm coming back yeah. Like I'm going to finish yeah. this. So well, and you talked too about one of the, one of the things you alluded to it a little bit is the mental health and and some of those aspects that come around. And we'll come back to that in a minute too. But there is it's hard to admit, but there's strength in admitting when you can't finish something. I mean, if we feel weak when we do it, but the truth is, um, it it takes more courage and more strength sometimes to say, you know, no, the best thing for me is the thing I don't want to admit or the thing I don't want to do. Oh, or giving absolutely. up on part of the stream or absolutely. that sort of stuff. So well, it is, it saying is no, I mean, quitting feel, socially feels like a weenie, but actually it was a kind of a moment of triumph for me because in a, it, in a way it was like, I don't care what people think. Yeah. I yeah. have to do what's good for me. And in a way, my whole trip was like that. I think, you know, going, jumping into my career when I just literally was so burnt out, could not even be good at anything. 
um, and going on my trip felt a little like that. It felt like weakness in some ways, but at the time, like it was also what was best for me. So I think you do have to, sometimes you're right, like saying no and not caring what people think, but doing what's good for you. People will perceive it as weakness, but it's actually strength. And I think more people actually think it's strength, you know, like perceive it as strength than you other people probably think yeah like there probably weren't as I, I there was probably pretty few of us watching your instagram thing that were like what a weenie she quit after four weeks of hiking mountains you know <laughs> she hiked 400 miles None no not enough there. <laughs> so then um then you you took some time and spent some time at a place called Labrie. tell us uh, what that place is and and kind of why you went and what you were doing while you were there sure so a lot of um like my parents and my grandparents' generation seemed to be a, really aware of Libri, but I would say that Libri is not really something that my generation is particularly familiar with. I had heard about Libri through Rod Reed, the university's former chaplain, and um, he took students there as part of like a study abroad trip or a pilgrimage. Mm-hmm. Um, that's also how I learned about the Camino is through him. Right. Um, so when I went to Labrie, Labrie is the original, the OG Labrie is situated <laughs> in Switzerland and it was started by Francis and Edith Schaefer, who were American missionaries living in um, Switzerland because Switzerland is a kind of a divided country. It, it has three languages. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's got French, Italian and German because it borders all those countries and all the different religions that kind of go with the languages are also present in yeah. Labrie. So mm-hmm. Francis and Edith were there as missionaries and and ha- kind of a crazy series of events, but ended up not really having a home for a while and being on the verge of being kicked out of Switzerland. And God provided this amazing chalet. And they didn't even know how amazing it was because the day that they closed on it, the money came out of nowhere and it was a cloudy day. And then the next day it was clear and they had this amazing view of the Alps. And wow. it was stunning, 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 like such a gift from God. And over the years, that was started in like the 50s. They accumulated more chalets kind of on this hillside near Villar, which is like a a really amazing tourist destination for world-class skiing, obviously, because it's in the Alps. And basically how it came to be is Francis and Edith quickly, I mean, as part of their ministry, they just really had a heart for people to come and seek answers to their honest questions from Mm -hmm. wherever they were in life. And Libri has really stuck to that mission. And so today we joke, I mean, how do you even describe what Libri is to other people? We're like, I don't know. It's kind of like a hippie commune and like a kind of like a school and a fellowship, but also like a retreat. So we joke. But uh, yeah, so to, still to this day, you can go travel to Libri and you can stay there for pretty much any amount of time you would like. And there's a small tuition fee, which really just covers room and board and food. They really run it very minimally. Um, but you spend half your day cleaning, which is part of the commune part right, communal right, part yeah. of living you know uh-huh. cooking food cleaning making sure everyone doesn't get sick doing laundry and then the second part of your day is devoted to study so you every day you study for four hours a day of whatever you'd like and they have this whole chalet kind of down at the bottom of the mountain um called feral house that is just a really amazing library spectacular resources just as you can imagine over yeah. 70 years of yeah. ministry and um yeah, so you can study whatever you like, and awesome. you also have formal lunches. So you, you go have lunch at different um, employees' houses while they're chalets, and mm-hmm. you're divided up into groups, and you cook with each other. And they're called formal lunches because at each of these lunches, they happen a couple times a week, someone gets to pose a question to what they've been studying. Okay. Um, could be something about homosexuality. It could be something about the Trinity. It could be something about the Holy, what a, you know, the Holy yeah. Spirit, whatever. And then the whole for the whole rest of the lunch, um, you know, the whole the the rest of the table talks about talks your about question it. and yeah. gives their two cents. And yeah. so it's really great. Amazing cool. community. Yeah. yeah. So um, and I know you did some other traveling and stuff in there, too. You have amazing pictures. Totally jealous. But from your summer from Labrie and El Camino and just their travels in general, what were some of the major like takeaways that you're coming back um, and saying these are the things that I've kind of learned about myself or others or that sort of stuff? Gosh, I feel like I learned so much on my trip. I kind of, in a way, an overarching kind of idea that I have from the summer is it's not really where I found myself necessarily, but I would say in a way it's where I met myself in the sense like I have this this phrase that keeps kind of running around in my head where the mountain where the mountains met the sea. And that 
is both the ge- its geographical significance because mm-hmm. in Ireland, these ama- where I also traveled, these amazing mountains like plunge into the sea and it's so beautiful. And then in, Sw- in Spain, when I was on the Camino, I was hiking all those mountains, but I was near the coast. So it was like this constant like mountains and sea picture. And but it, that has kind of metaphorical significance because I felt like at the end of grad school, when I left for my trip, I felt like this mountain version of me, this like striving and achieving kind of person of, of following all my gifts and talents and seeing what I was capable of put me in this, this place, um, and, and learned what I was capable of. And so, but it, I think I would say it left me with some polish, but it also left me kind of jagged and, and raw in other ways. Um, so this may be professional worker side of me, um, was the mountain, but where the mountain of me met the sea of me was, kind of the, my trip was the come down, right? Mm-hmm. It was this time to be with myself and the sea is the version of myself that I met there. It was the stillness, the calmness where I learned kind of the depth of myself, the kindness and the love that I have. And, um, so in that sense, I feel like the mountain of me met the sea of me mm-hmm. there. Um, and I have like a more holistic picture of myself, definitely feel more healthy and fulfilled and content and happy but I would say, yeah, recovering from mental health was really critical for me because, you know, whether you're in grad school or whether you're just not in grad school and you're just working crazy, I mean, I think people kind of experience burning the candle at both ends at different times of life. Right. It could be yeah. that you're a single mom, but you've got a million kids and you're doing this thing, you know. Mm-hmm. So for me, that was in grad school and it was I was going to grad school full time. I was working full time. And even in part of that, I was doing like a 20 hour a week consulting project on the side side hustle. <laughs> and I just, yeah, was burnt out. And so part of it was going going abroad to really um be with myself and reflect on that and all that had happened and who I had become, but also who I wanted to be and doing the, the hard work of, of getting back to like a healthy place for me, you know, you'll always have naysayers. You always have haters in your life, right? (laughs) Who will say, no, don't do that. Do this other thing. But for me, it was like, look, I know it looks maybe like weakness to not get to work Mm -hmm. right now. And to take and spend all my money Mm -hmm. abroad. But it was also like, I regret none of it. It was, it was what I needed for the time. Um, So part of that really led to an acceptance of myself um, Mm -hmm. that I hadn't really maybe experienced before, just because when you're abroad and you're by yourself, it's like, you're your only travel companion. Right. And I learned that I do like myself. I learned that I am resourceful, that I'm capable um, and in a way I had no one else until I went to Labrie. So I was like 10 weeks of being by myself and just had to really learn to befriend myself and like who I was, love who I was. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's a journey for all of us. Macklemore has a few songs about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then talk about you at Labrie. One of the things you mentioned when we were talking earlier was that finding of community. And we talk, we talk about the word community a lot at JBU. Hashtag community. Hashtag community. Um, you know, if you ask anybody like, why do you love JBU? Because of the community. The community. <laughs> Which is so hard to describe what you, what you mean when you say that. But yet we all know what it is here. But you also found that at Labrie. Talk about that and its importance in you like moving forward too. Absolutely. So, I mean, of course, as you touched on it, John Brown is such a special place for the hashtag community. <laughs> But that, I would say, is really a special part of undergrad here because this is a residential campus. have to live on campus for six semesters. Um, (laughs) It's worth it. It's worth it. It's so (laughs) worth it. Um, But part of that living is just, like, kind of having a constant stream of, like, amazing humans around that Mm -hmm. you do life together. Of course, you study, but then you also, like, are just good friends. And I think it is in that um, doing of life together. And in grad school, I think what kind of, in a way, led to my mental deterioration was a lack of community Mm. with maybe people my own age in a way. Um, And so when I was at Labrie, I had been traveling on my own for, as I said, you know, 10 weeks or whatever, doing walking 400 miles, climbing mountains. And at Labrie, I met these amazing people who were there who were just similar Similar, but also diverse from Mm -hmm. me too. But just people who cared about me, who loved Jesus, who didn't love Jesus, who were questioning things, but just honest people. And I felt like I could be truly myself with them and um, just really found 
yeah, people who care about me. And I think that it was, it was a taste of what I experienced in undergrad and, and really one of my last days, last weeks at Labrie, I kind of had this, um, awakening perhaps we had, we were having a lecture from a really renowned, um, artist at Labrie and, um, I was asking her, I was like, you know, how do you achieve as much as you have in life while also, you know, staying true to family and resting and all that? And she was like, well, you know, part of it is I think you have to figure out what you want. And I was like, oh, my gosh, light went off. I don't think I've ever asked myself, what do I want? In a way, I think I was following the footsteps of maybe what. What you think you're supposed to want. What you think you're supposed to want. What yeah. society, culture wants for you. Yeah. The American dream, you yeah. know, follow that. But I was like, oh my gosh, what do I want? And so I think I realized work is important and vocation is important. And at John Brown, I learned so much about like how vocation can be worship. But I think somewhere along in there, in my time, my last couple years at grad school got twisted around that like work is all there is. It is the end to everything. Yeah. Um, most important thing. And there I was like, what do I want? Do I want to be working forever? I mean, of course work is really great, but I think I want friendship too. Mm -hmm. And I want a social life and I want people to cook dinner with. And I want people who miss me when I'm gone and who are excited when I get back. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I kind of made some pretty big changes in my life based on this question of what do you want? I do want to work and I do want to have meaningful work. Um, and I want to be able to buy food, but I also want to be able to travel and feed this wild part of my spirit while also yeah. having friendship. Yeah. So that actually affected then when you came back and you started job hunting again and all of that. Talk a little bit about how that changed what you actually did during the job hunting process in your new job. Yeah. So actually at Labrie, because I was still... Um, it was towards the end of my trip. I was kind of looking for jobs before I got back. I was applying for this job and I was so stressed. And my friends at Labrie are like, why are you so stressed about applying for this job? And I was like, I don't know. It's just a big deal. It would be very cool. It's been recommended to me. I think some people like expect that I should get this certain thing. And they're like, okay, question mark, is it even healthy for you? Mm-hmm. And so I was like, really kind of sat with that question. It's like, if I did this job, would I be a healthy version of me? And I was like, mm, I mean, maybe, but like, Obviously, I don't really want to do it. It's really stressing me out. So I didn't apply for that job. But when I got back, I just was really praying. I was like, Lord, you know what my next season's supposed to be. You know where I'm supposed to go. Really laying that in his hands. Because my future, the unknown is, that's some of the hardest time to trust God, I think. Especially if you're uh, like, I'm a control freak. So I'm like, I know. I'm such a three Enneagram. Such an achiever. So anyway, literally the day I got back, August 22nd, I was on my flight praying and like stewing over the unknown and how uncomfortable I was with it. Got down, landed in, I don't know, Boston and got an email from one of my con- connections being like, hey, we'd, we'd like to talk to you about like a position. And it was so not even me. It was so just the favor of God yeah. answering my prayers. And yeah. so I did kind of embark more on this um, applying for jobs journey once I got back and one thing led to another. And that's how I got my job now but I I am actually so this job's in Portland and I'm actually moving to Florida so I'm here with Julie and Siloam <laughs> because I'm driving You're to driving. Florida with my U-Haul and kayak so I decided to, I wanted to live in Florida and I was really upfront with people that through the interview process at this company um, you know I could move to Portland right now mm-hmm. I am going to yeah. relocate and I could make great friends there but I also know that I'm a bit of a workaholic if I move to a place with zero friends right now on the heels of this kind of hard year and all the growth I've done in Europe then I'd probably fall back into that so um, I just said hey you know what would you think if I worked remotely and they're like okay why and I was like well there's lots of reasons there's lots of reasons but one of those things was to build a life outside of work that was balanced. And, you know, when you're married and you get a new job, your fam goes with, right? right? Yeah. And so you, you kind of have your humans mm-hmm. with you as you're doing a new thing. Yeah. But as a single person, just starting out, you move some, you relocate and like you're on your own yeah. in a whole new city. Yeah, it's difficult. It yeah. is difficult. So I was like, okay, well, there's a bunch of these people that I met at Labrie. They live in Florida. I'll look there. And I asked my company and they were like, okay, and letting me work from Florida, which part of it is from, you know, uh, who do you come home? Like, I want roommates that I can live with yeah. and I want to seek out that community still. And I want people to cook dinner with, and I want to go to the I don't know, go adventuring with them and celebrate Halloween and Thanksgiving with, with people, not yeah. just living the isolated, lonely, horrible, awful life. Yeah. Well, I mean, we talk about sometimes we, um, but 
God made us for connection. He wired us to be mm-hmm. connected to him and to other human beings. And so I think that's usually one of the greatest things that can affect our mental health is when we, we don't have those those built-in communication those built-in connections with people, people that share our faith, people that share our hobbies, people that share all of those things. So yeah, that's super exciting that you were able to kind of set that as I know, a priority they've been so gracious. and really like follow through with that. So yeah, this company is really amazing and it is really the favor of God and just him redirecting me into community where you can like flourish and thrive. And it's not to say that like, if you don't have it, you're, right. oh no. Well, I think you but, just have to work harder to create it. And yeah. I think too, so many of our, um, our students, you know, graduate and go take jobs in different cities. And it does just take, it takes intention it does. to, I mean, yeah, sure, you can make friends at work, but it takes intention to find a church or find some travel groups or some of these other groups that you sports can make teams friends, sports or, teams, or, teams mm-hmm. whatever it is. Um, and especially too, I think if you're introverted or you're like one of those yeah. people who doesn't naturally seek out those connections, it can just be it an takes even a long bigger time. challenge. It yeah. takes a long time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think one of the best things I learned while I was abroad was in a way how to connect with people. People, oh gosh, I feel like I, my mind was so open because here I am on my own, really in the world, kind of for the first time without any kind of Christian community and just really learning to people who have much different faith ideas than me people who have very different politics than me um people who had different upbringings cultures Mm -hmm. just so much different things than me um and just holding room space for all the differences of people and still like loving them still yeah and also learning to talk to people in real life you know I mean we're so quick to be in our phones myself included but some of my favorite conversations were just around tables and with strangers on buses and being so like interested in them that they feel so special and valued. And one of my favorite conversations was with this older Italian woman one night on the Camino and she like did not really speak English, but you know, a lot of communication really is nonverbal. So of course you can figure it out. But she, she texts me sometimes on WhatsApp and she's like, Lynn, we are waiting for you in Italy. In Italy, come visit us. <laughs> ciao, ciao. <laughs> Kissy face emoji. <laughs> and uh, no, but we had great conversation that night. And yeah, I mean, language was a barrier, but it, you still figure it out. So. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. awesome. Well, we're excited. I uh, can't wait to hear more about how you plant yourself in that community and flourish. And so we thank you for coming on the podcast today and sharing about your adventure. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. What a joy. Thanks for listening to this episode of JBU Stories. Visit jbu.edu slash stories for a transcript of today's show, links, and show notes. Be sure to subscribe to JBU Stories on iTunes, and we'd love it if you would leave us a review.